Picture this. You're settling into your economy seat for a six-hour flight, and the flight attendant begins the safety demonstration. They show you the life vest under your seat, explain how to inflate it, and remind you to put it on only after exiting the aircraft. But here's a question that might keep you awake for the next six hours. Why is there a life vest under your seat, but no parachute? I mean, think about it logically. Cars have airbags for crashes on land. Boats have life rafts for emergencies at sea. So why don't airplanes, flying machines literally suspended miles above the earth, have the one piece of equipment that could theoretically save your life if something goes horribly wrong? The answer isn't what you think. It's not just about money, though that is part of it. It's not just about regulations, though those matter too. The real reason reveals some truly mind-bending physics, deadly environmental factors, and statistics about air crashes that might surprise you. Today we're going to uncover the shocking truth about why airlines chose flotation over salvation, and why you should probably be grateful that they did. Section 1. The Physics Problem Let's start with the most fundamental issue. Commercial airliners aren't skydiving planes, and the physics involved would likely kill you before you even had a chance to deploy a parachute. When you watch those fetch action movies where someone jumps out of a commercial airliner and deploys their chute like it's no big deal, you're watching pure fantasy. Here's why. A typical skydiving plane is small, think Cessna 172 or similar aircraft, and cruises at around 80 to 110 miles per hour when skydivers jump. Even then, it takes extensive training. A first-time tandem jump, when you're literally strapped to an instructor who does everything for you, still requires at least 30 minutes of safety briefing. If you want to jump independently, you'll need a full day of ground training. Now, contrast that with a commercial airliner. Your Boeing 737 or Airbus A320 is cruising at 450 to 600 miles per hour. Some aircraft go even faster. At that speed, jumping out would be like being hit by a train. Here's what would actually happen. The moment you exit the aircraft, you'd be traveling at the same speed as the plane, roughly 600 miles an hour. Standard parachutes are designed to open at speeds around 110 knots, which is about 127 miles per hour. Open a parachute at 600 miles per hour and the fabric would be torn to shreds instantly. Even if you could somehow survive the initial exit, you'd face an even deadlier problem. You'd almost certainly hit the aircraft itself. Skydiving planes are designed with this in mind. They're small so the jumpers can clear them immediately. Military aircraft have rear ramps specifically designed for safe exits. Commercial airliners? They have neither. Jump from a typical passenger door and you're likely to be sucked into an engine, smash into a wing, or get pounded by the tail section. At 600 miles per hour, any contact with the aircraft would be instantly fatal. Section 2. Altitude Reality – The Death Zone But let's say, hypothetically, you somehow managed to steer clear of the aircraft. Now you're falling free at 35,000 feet. Congratulations! You're about to experience what mountaineers call the death zone. Commercial aircraft crews between 30 and 42,000 feet. Skydivers, even experienced ones, jump no higher than 15,000 feet, and more typically between 10 and 13,000 feet. Why? Because above 15,000 feet, there isn't enough oxygen to keep you conscious. At 35,000 feet, you maybe have 15 to 30 seconds of useful consciousness before hypoxia kicks in. That's the condition where your brain, starved of oxygen, starts shutting down. You'd likely pass out long before you descended to breathable air, assuming you ever woke up to deploy your parachute. The temperature at cruising altitude is typically around negative 56 degrees Celsius or negative 69 degrees Fahrenheit. That's colder than Antarctica in winter. Without proper insulation, you'd suffer severe frostbite within minutes. Your hands would be too frozen to operate a parachute even if you remained conscious. So, to survive a jump from a commercial airliner, you'd need an oxygen tank, mask, regulator, heated flight suit, ballistic helmet, an altimeter, goggles, and, oh yeah, extensive training on how to use all of this equipment under extreme stress. At this point, you're talking about equipping every passenger like their military special operations troops. The logistics alone are staggering. Section 3. When crashes actually happen. But here's the real kicker that makes parachutes completely irrelevant for airline safety. The vast majority of airplane crashes don't happen at cruising altitude, where parachutes might theoretically be useful. 
According to data from the International Air Transport Association, which tracks accidents from 2005 to 2023, here's when airplane crashes actually occurred. 53% of all aviation accidents happened during landing. That's more than half. The approach and landing phases are incredibly complex, requiring pilots to manage descent rates, monitor instruments, communicate with air traffic control, and deal with environmental factors like wind and weather. 8.5% happened during takeoff. That's when you get burn strikes, like the famous Hudson River incident, or mechanical failures during the high-stress, high-power phase of flight. Another 8.3% occur during the approach phase before landing. 6.1% happened during the initial climb right after takeoff. And here's the crucial number. Only about 9% of fatal accidents happen during cruise flight, when you're at the altitude where parachutes might theoretically be useful. Think about it this way. Aviation professionals have a saying that the most dangerous parts of any flight are the first three minutes after takeoff and the last eight minutes before landing. During these phases, you're close to the ground with little time to react to problems. If something goes catastrophically wrong during takeoff, engine failure, bird strike, whatever, you have seconds, not minutes, to deal with it. There's no time to distribute parachutes, brief passengers, and coordinate an evacuation. The Hudson River flight lasted less than four minutes from bird strike to water landing. If something goes wrong during landing approach, again, you're close to the ground with limited time and options. In these scenarios, parachutes are worse than useless. They're a dangerous distraction from what might actually save lives. Section four, the Hudson River case study. Let's examine the most famous water landing in recent memory, US Airways Flight 1549, the miracle on the Hudson. This case perfectly illustrates both why flotation devices make sense and why parachutes would have been catastrophic. On January 15, 2009, Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger and First Officer Jeffrey Skies were departing LaGuardia Airport in an Airbus A320 when they struck a flock of Canada geese. Both engines were severely damaged, causing an almost immediate loss of thrust. The entire crisis lasted less than four minutes, from bird strike to water landing, three minutes and 28 seconds. Now, imagine if the airline had decided to equip passengers with parachutes instead of life vests. In those three minutes and 28 seconds, the crew would have had to diagnose the problem, attempt to restart the engines, communicate with air traffic control, evaluate landing options, set up for an emergency landing, brief passengers on parachute use, help 150 passengers put on parachutes quickly, coordinate a mass evacuation from the aircraft, and hope everyone survives jumping into the freezing Hudson River from 2,800 feet. It's absurd when you think about it. Instead, Sullenberger focused on what actually mattered, flying the plane and getting it down safely. The A320 was equipped for extended overwater operations, which meant it had full life vest provisions. The exit slides could detach and function as life rafts. When the plane hit the water, passengers evacuated onto the wings and into the rafts. But here's the sobering reality. Even with life vests available, most passengers couldn't use them properly. Of the 150 passengers, only 33 retrieved life vests during the evacuation. Of those 33, only four managed to put them on correctly. Many passengers didn't even know where their life vests were located. Others couldn't figure out how to put them on during the chaos of the emergency evacuation. Some passengers standing on the wings in knee-deep freezing water didn't have any flotation at all. The lesson? Even simple safety equipment is challenging to use correctly during an emergency. The idea that untrained passengers could successfully use parachutes during a crisis is fantasy. Section 5. The Training Problem This brings us to perhaps the most overlooked aspect of the parachute question, the training requirement. Professional skydivers undergo extensive training, even for a tandem jump when you're essentially cargo strapped onto another person. You need detailed safety briefings covering body position, emergency procedures, and landing techniques. For solo jumps, the training is intensive. You'll need to learn how to maintain proper body position during freefall, how to deploy your main chute, what to do if your main chute fails, how to operate your reserve chute, how to steer and control your descent, how to land safely without injury, hand signals for communication, and emergency procedures for various scenarios. This typically requires four to eight hours of ground training, plus practice jumps with instructors. Now imagine trying to provide this level of training to airline passengers. Would you need to complete parachute training before buying a ticket? Would airlines need to conduct hour-long safety briefings before every flight instead of the current five-minute demonstration? Consider the demographics of airline passengers. Elderly people, children, individuals with disabilities, 
people who are afraid of heights, pregnant women, and passengers who might panic in an emergency situation. The idea that this diverse group could successfully execute complex parachute procedures during a crisis is unrealistic. Even experienced skydivers have accident rates. According to the United States Parachute Association, there were 10 fatal skydiving accidents for every 100,000 jumps in 2023. And that's with trained, prepared individuals jumping from ideal conditions at appropriate altitudes. Section 6, the weight and cost factor. Let's talk numbers. A standard passenger parachute weighs about 20 to 30 pounds. For a Boeing 737-800 with 189 passengers, that's roughly 5,670 pounds of additional weight just for the parachutes, not including the additional safety equipment each passenger would need. That's equivalent to removing about 25 to 30 passengers worth of weight capacity from every flight. Airlines operate on razor thin profit margins and every pound matters for fuel efficiency and operational costs. But the parachutes themselves are just the beginning. Remember, passengers would also need oxygen tanks and masks for high altitude survival, insulated flight suits for extreme cold, helmets for protection, altimeters to know when to deploy chutes, training and certification programs, specialized storage systems in the cabin, and additional flight crew training on parachute procedures. We're talking about adding 6,000 to 8,000 pounds per aircraft, plus hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment costs per plane, plus ongoing training and maintenance expenses. The airlines would pass these costs directly to passengers. Your $200 domestic flight might become a $400 flight. International routes could see even bigger increases. And here's the kicker. All of this expense and complexity would address less than 10% of the aviation accidents. Only those rare cases where something goes catastrophically wrong during cruise flight. Section 7. E-Tops. When life vests are required. So if parachutes don't make sense, when and why are life vests actually required? This brings us to one of aviation's most important but least known regulations, E-Tops. E-Tops originally stood for Extended Range Twin Engine Operations Performance Standards, though now it's sometimes called simply Extended Operations. These are the rules that determine how far twin engine aircraft can fly from the nearest airport. Back in the 1980s, FAA Director J. Lynn Helms famously said, it'll be a cold day in hell before I let the twins fly long haul over water routes. He was concerned about the reliability of twin engine aircraft for flights over the oceans, where emergency landing options are limited. But as engine technology improved, the regulations evolved. Today, some aircraft are certified for ETOPS 370, meaning they can fly up to 370 minutes over six hours from the nearest suitable airport. Here's where life vests become legally mandatory. For flights over water more than 50 nautical miles from the nearest shore, aircraft must carry life preservers for each occupant. For flights more than 30 minutes or 100 nautical miles from shore, whichever is less, they need additional survival equipment, including life rafts, signal flares, and emergency radios. These regulations exist because water landings, while rare, are survivable. Statistics show that 89% of occupants survive water landings in general aviation aircraft. The key is staying afloat long enough for rescue, which is where the flotation devices become critical. Life vests are lightweight and compact. Simple to use, though, as the Hudson River showed, practice helps. Effective for their intended purpose. Required by international aviation law for overwater flights and proven technology that has saved countless lives. Section 8. The Real Solution Prevention the aviation industry learned long ago that the best approach to safety isn't planning for crashes, it's preventing them altogether. Modern commercial aviation has become extraordinarily safe through redundant systems. Critical aircraft systems have multiple backups. If one system fails, others take over. Rigorous maintenance. Airlines follow strict inspection and maintenance schedules that far exceed what's required for cars or other vehicles. Advanced training. Pilots undergo extensive initial training and recurring training throughout their careers, including simulator sessions that prepare them for emergency scenarios. Air traffic control. Sophisticated radar and communication systems help prevent collisions and guide aircraft around severe weather. Weather radar. Modern aircraft can detect and avoid dangerous weather conditions. Improved airports. Better runway design, lighting, and emergency response capabilities reduce the risk of ground accidents. The result? Commercial aviation has a fatality rate of roughly 0.07 deaths per billion passenger miles. You're statistically more likely to be struck by lightning than to die in a commercial aviation accident. 
When the industry does plan for emergencies, it focuses on the scenarios that are most likely to occur and be most survivable. Water landings fall into this category. High altitude catastrophic failures requiring passenger parachuting do not. Closing. So, the next time you board a commercial flight and notice the life vest under your seat, remember, it's not there because airlines are cheap or because regulators lack imagination. It's there because aviation safety experts have carefully analyzed thousands of accidents, studied the physics of high altitude flight, and determined the most effective ways to save lives. The absence of parachutes isn't a safety oversight, it's a safety feature. Those resources that might go towards parachute equipment and training are instead invested in preventing accidents altogether, designing more reliable aircraft, training better pilots, and improving the emergency response for the scenarios where passengers actually have a fighting chance. Aviation safety is about making the smart choices based on data, physics, and human factors. Sometimes the smartest choice is admitting that certain Hollywood scenarios just don't work in real life. The life vest under your seat represents a triumph of practical engineering over wishful thinking. It's a simple, proven solution to a real problem that passengers might actually face. And in the incredibly unlikely event that you need it, you'll probably be grateful that the airline safety experts prioritize flotation over fantasy. Next time someone asks why planes don't have parachutes, you can tell them because the people who design aircraft safety systems understand physics, statistics, and human nature better than action movie directors. Your flight is almost certainly going to land safely at its intended destination. But if something does go wrong, the safety equipment on board was chosen by people who understand the difference between what looks heroic and what actually saves lives.